I'm James Ford, and uh, I'm uh, just really privileged to to speak once again with my my community of the heart, Empty Moon, and our our Saturday morning set. Uh, I as as many of you know, I I have this past week signed a contract with uh, Shambhala Publications to uh, uh, to do what will be my sixth book. Uh, this one is an exploration of the arc of the uh, uh, the spiritual life, and uh, 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 it's anchored in the Zen tradition. But but you know, as is our times, uh, informed by the the range of the spiritual uh, uh, spiritual life found in in major religious traditions, particularly uh, for for me, Christianity, a little Hinduism. Uh, yeah, yeah. Read the book. <laughs> uh, now, uh, my giving this talk that I might, you know, you know, have the advantage of workshopping a little bit uh, uh, of the parts, but I have to confess I've mainly done that already uh, uh, with you all and um, at the First Unitarian Church of Los Angeles and a couple of other venues. My blog, most especially, um, you'll you'll find if you see the book. Uh, um, um, things you may have may have encountered in some part uh, here and there. Uh, so I was I was looking for what might be interesting and useful for us uh, all together uh, at this time, um, um, and I thought I would I would um, go to the fifth chapter, the introductory materials, the kind of the concluding materials. <laughs> uh, if you follow our our uh, empty moon community. Uh, Heard a bit of that uh, recently. Um, this is about establishing a spiritual practice, and I thought that was maybe useful to all of us, whether we're old hands or newer. Most of the people on uh, um, in our immediate sitting group are are old hands. Some of the people in the uh, um, the, the the broader world that might see the video, uh, um, who knows where you are in this thing. We're all beginners, however, and it never hurts to review. I was in Bhutan, uh, sitting in a downtown Thimphu coffee house. Uh, I'd been invited on a visit to the country for a spiritual pilgrimage. I sang for my supper, giving some talks on Buddhism and Zen as part of a larger program. It was one of those most wonderful things, and there I was waiting for my companions who had wanted to do some shopping. The person sitting next to me was a Bhutanese national, and we began to talk. Nearly everyone speaks English. It's the official language of government and much of commerce. I quickly found the first question from a Bhutanese to someone visiting is usually inquiring what one thinks of their country, which I can easily respond to by saying, I love it. Uh, I have fallen in love with Bhutan. He asked if I were a follower of the Dharma, and I replied yes, but not within the Vajrayana, about which I admitted I know shamefully little. I thought it was inviting him into a conversation about his version of our way, but instead he wanted to know about my Buddhist background. I said I was a Zen priest within a Japanese tradition adding in something about my also being a Unitarian minister seemed to be a bit complicated for what was going to be a very brief conversation. And whatever the gifts of my Unitarian part of my life, and there certainly have been many, the root of my spirituality is the Dharma. He wanted some clarification about the Zen part and asked if I were a monk. I said, no sliding over the fact that we traditionally do use monastic language to describe our ordination model. But we're not celibate, not monastic in that commonly understood way. So no was an answer to the meta question, was I a Vinaya monk? But I was not a lay person either. I was someone with some monastic training and cumulative many years of intensive training. The best word I found for what I am is priest. A Zen priest, someone with a long, long years of training, a commitment and vow, an obligation of transmitting the forms and style as best I can, and empowerments to do these things within a lineage. He smiled broadly and said, Ah, 
ah, you're a gum chip, a Zim gum chip. I, I was pretty sure I wasn't being insulted, but just to be sure, I asked what that meant, and he replied how a gumption meant, quote, a great meditator. He explained in addition to nuns and monks, Vinaya ordained clergy in Bhutan and other Vaj Vajrayana cultures, gumption are a very important part in the community religious life. They're not ordained in that monastic sense, but they are trained, have received empowerments, can perform critical rituals, and are spiritual leaders. They can and frequently marry. Usually they live in the village and have an ordinary trade. To repeat, reply, repeat, gamchen. And he put his hands together and bowed to me. I had the feeling if we weren't in a coffee shop, he would have done a full prostration. Soon he left and my companions arrived. I've never forgotten that exchange, part of a cluster of never forgotten moments from that trip. It also points to some important things about embarking on the spiritual life, especially in our contemporary West where monasticism or even an extended stay in a monastery is difficult. For many, especially pretty much anyone with a committed relationship, close to impossible. It led me to thinking about the shape of spiritual life today, and particularly for those of us in our Western cultures, where, as I've noted, monasticism is not normative. And beyond that, simply not possible for many who care about the deeper currents of the spiritual life. One of the more interesting characteristics of our emerging Western Zen practice is its heavy emphasis on lay practice or perhaps with the negative connotations of lay as somehow lesser, a better term perhaps is householder practice. People have been wrestling with the shape of an authentic practice here in the West for decades. And some good counsel is shaping up for those who find themselves embarked on the spiritual quest, but who are not going to be monastics for life or even for a few years. It's good to know that while monasticism is normative for serious spiritual practice in the East, it isn't as binary as some might think. There are a lot of gamchen, if you will, arising out of, uh, out of different pers uh, disciplines. People are finding wholehearted paths outside of the professional religious class. The important point here is to find some community of practice that resonates with your heart. It might be monastic, it probably isn't. There's a lot of room for Gamsham style practice emerging in the West. Some are wonderful and some you would be advised to avoid. Do your homework, take your time, and always reserve your own final judgment. The important points. Having a practice is critical. Finding a community is itself very very important. But there are different communities arising, so look for the right one. And then there are vows. Finding the right promises to frame our intention is equally important with finding a practice and a community. These are the lattice work that allow us to grow. So it is important to tie oneself to the tradition with the power of vow. Vows are promises. We publicly commit to something. Vow takes on a sacred quality. In the West, a vow is made before God. A vow is a promise made publicly and with sacred intention. It is in service to the goal, to the quest. And certain vows are critical to the spiritual path. I, sus I suggest specifically taking up Zen's precepts and the establishing of a personal rule of life. Gautama Siddhartha counseled householders as well as monastics to undertake vows. He suggested the first five of the monastic vows. Well, this volume that I'm writing and have written actually, um, I hope yet to be heavily edited, um, is a map of the spiritual life. It should be useful for monastics, but it assumes most who read it will not be monastics, but rather householders. It turns out to step into the deep, whether as a renunciant or as someone living an ordinary life, we need, in addition to the calling into a deeper vision, in addition to a meditative or prayer discipline, a container for our hearts. 
with five or 10 or 200 precepts, we find the shape of that container. Japanese Zen emerged in the Middle Ages with 10 or 16 vows, depending on the school. These became the vows for householders and for monastics, as well as for that emergent non-celibate clerical community. They come by way of a fifth century scripture from China called the Brahmajala, uh, the, Brahma, or the Brahma net, which features 10 major and 48 minor precepts. The five of the major precepts are nearly identical with the monastic codes. Of course, the rule around sexuality is understood differently for monastic and householder. And also the traditional framing around intoxication in the Brahmajala version is actually about dealing in alcohol, although the nuances regarding the problems with intoxication are still there. In Japanese Soto Zen, which has 16 precepts, the first three are simply the traditional Buddhist refuges. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. They're followed by the three pure precepts, which are a reworking from the Dhammapada. Um, here is, as they're presented in our own uh, uh, empty moon uh, community, renounce all evil, practice all good, and save the many beings. Uh, uh, Domio Burke uh, did a wonderful variation on this on the ten precepts, which I s cite in uh, in this manuscript. Um, um, I'll just run through the list rather than the whole thing. Uh, um, and worth digging in, worth all the time, but for our moment here. Don't kill, uh, don't steal, uh, don't misuse your sexuality, um, do not speak dishonestly, do not become intoxicated, do not dwell on your past mistakes, uh, create wisdom from that ignorance, um, do not praise self or blame others, do not be mean, stingy with the Dharma or your wealth. Do not indulge anger. Cultivate equanimity. Um, to be, uh, do not defame the three treasures. You know, Buddha Dharma Sangha, uh, and I think that could be writ large, uh, very profitably when we think about defaming. Uh, those those precepts they become a frame for our life. Uh, on the one hand, when we're beginning, they become a container to hold us and our intention. On the other hand, as we deepen into the way, we see how they are in fact expressions of the deep itself, a feedback loop into the heart. Beyond this, I encourage the creation of a personal rule of life. In some Zen schools, there's a ceremony where a spiritual director and a student of the way covenant to work together. In the schools in which I practice, the covenant we practice, the covenant has eight steps. The first two turning on expectations in the relationship between teacher and student. I encourage anyone embarked on this intimate way to sit down and write a personal rule, perhaps using the additional six uh, points as a frame. They are first a commitment to a regular practice. Think uh, what you might be a reasonable take on giving uh, take given the constraints of time and place. Two, make a commitment to retreats. Again, looking at what is realistic, but also making a commitment. Three, making a commitment to participate in a community of practice and do what it takes to be part of that community. Study, at the very least, you know, find a reading list and read. Uh, if you can, commit to taking classes and um, and list what they will be in this next year. Uh, fifth, find some expression for your spiritual lives in, your, in practical ways. Volunteer at a soup kitchen. Involve yourself in a, a worthy political cause. There are a couple right now. Uh, do some work for others. And sixth, find a creative expression. <laughs> Zen in the West, uh, Zen in Japan, art, music dance, you know, something that stretches you and is maybe fun. Commit to live by this rule for a year. If you don't have a spiritual director, show it to a friend, someone you trust. Ideally, someone who shares the spiritual path or at least spiritual aspirations. And then write it down, sign it. Look at it at least once a month. Think about what you're doing. Then at the end of the year, revise it as seems appropriate. Actually, if you see you're unable to keep up some aspect of it, 
you don't have to wait for a year to rewrite it. But also don't be hasty in adjusting your promises. With these things, a clear intention, beginning a serious practice, making vows, looking for those companions on the way, uh, in traditional or creative ways, one's spiritual life is becoming established. And who knows, maybe you become a gumption. Thank you so very much.